everyone, and thank you for joining us in our session this morning. Today, we're welcoming Ian Kallmeyer, Director of New Product Development and Portfolio Planning of Hoffman LaRoche Limited. Ian is stepping in for CEO Ronnie Miller, who unfortunately couldn't join us this morning. Uh, to tell you a little bit about Ian, Ian began his career in the pharmaceutical industry with Astra Pharma as supervisor of the Microbiology Laboratory. Ian then moved to LaRoche to take on a position in regulatory affairs. He then took on a primary care sales role and further rounded out his experience through progressive positions in medical marketing and product management. In 2005, Ian joined the newly formed Rheumatology Business Unit as Director of Medical Marketing and launched two new innovative biologics for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. He was then appointed the Business Unit Director for Ritexen RA. Ian is currently the Director of New Product and Portfolio Planning, where his focus is on early commercialization strategy for Russia's pipeline. Ian has an Honours Bachelor of Science degree in Microbiology and Biotechnology from the University of Guelph. Before we begin this morning, I ask that you please hold your questions until the end of the question and answer period. We welcome your questions for Ian, but they'll need to be at the microphones on either side of the, uh, of the floor. Uh, so please join me this morning in welcoming Ian to this, to this stage. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Ronnie sends his uh, apologies. He wasn't able to, um, to join you this morning. So when Ronnie was approached to speak here today, uh, he accepted immediately because events like Discovery present him the opportunity not only to talk about Roche and the work that he's very proud of, but also because he enjoys meeting uh, with other innovators, students, and entrepreneurs. Forums like this allow Ronnie to learn about what innovation looks like for other industries, the challenges you're facing, and how you plan to navigate and overcome them in the future. So Roche has been successful as a result of our willingness to embrace change and adopt an entrepreneurial approach to business. Over the next 20 minutes, I'd like to touch on a couple of areas that have been pivotal to our success. First, I'll share with you uh, a little bit about Roche's history, what we're doing that I believe makes us different from others in our industry, uh, both independently and through our partnerships and the impact of those efforts. And secondly, our vision for the future, what that means not only for us, but also our industry and, of course, most importantly, patients. Although Roche is well known as an innovative pharma and biotech company, our beginnings are much more diverse. So does anybody have an idea what these three things have in common? You could probably guess that we had something to do with it. So Roche was actually responsible for creating the scent that people would smell when they walked into KFC restaurants through a, a company called Givadon Roar, a fragrances and scent company. Uh, the technology in the LED watches, one that got away from us in the 70s, and uh, the scent associated with Calvin Klein perfume. So it isn't to say that we don't have strong roots in pharma as well. Uh, Roche was the first company to have a medicine that achieved blockbuster status, which means greater than $1 billion in revenue annually. And that drug, uh, some of you may have heard of it, uh, was Valium. So what I think this demonstrates is that you have to evolve and innovate. You can't remain stagnant or you will become obsolete. So Roche has been in Canada for more than 80 years. Uh, we first incorporated in Canada in 1931 in Quebec. The Canadian office is uh, close to here in Mississauga. We've got a brand new building that we moved to in October. It's shown on your left there. Uh, and that's home to both our pharmaceutical division as, one of, as well as one of Roche's global product development sites, which is a, uh, a new uh, initiative uh, in terms of moving jobs into Mississauga. We invested more than $190 million through the expansion of the pharmaceutical division, and this brought more than 200 sorry, newly high-skilled jobs to Canada. And the capital expenditure alone for that building was uh, approximately $33 million. Our diagnostics building, you see it uh, on the right there, is, uh, is based in Montreal. It's separate from our pharma business, 
Uh, I'll share with you uh, later how it creates significant advantage for us within our industry. We're now the world's leading pharmaceutical company in hospital sales and have established ourselves as an industry leader in oncology. However, we didn't achieve this success entirely on our own. No one really has a monopoly on drug discovery. And we realized that we needed to look beyond the walls of Roche to deliver uh, on the unmet needs of patients. And we've done that on two fronts, both through partnerships and uh, acquisitions. Like many global organizations, Roche sees tremendous uh, potential in Canada as a destination for international projects. From a healthcare perspective, uh, the quality of the research that's done here is really second to none in the world. Many Canadian hospitals and universities are home to significant studies and programs that are led by physicians who are recognized as international experts in their field. It's quite common, actually, to have uh, global medical advisory boards led uh, by physicians that we're fortunate to work with uh, on a regular basis because we're right here in our backyard, and particularly some of the research in hospital institutions in Toronto. We have several global partnerships currently underway across Canada. You see a couple of them here. Uh, in Quebec, the Montreal Heart Institute is one of eight global centers of excellence with a focus on cardiology. And on the West Coast, we also have uh, several significant partnerships, including a $600 million agreement with Xenon Pharmaceuticals to collaborate in the discovery of compounds and diagnostics on the treatment of pain. Uh, here in Ontario, uh, with the UHN, uh, Princess Margaret Hospital, and Sunnybrook, they're uh, known really as our go-to sites for early research and development. Princess Margaret uh, has become one of our best institutions for phase one trials in oncology. Outside of Canada, uh, Roche has collaborated for a number of years with Genentech. Some of you may have heard of uh, the company. It's considered the founder of the biotech industry based in San Francisco. And in 2009, Roche acquired Genentech and created the world's largest biotech company. The integration of Genentech's expertise in biotechnology and Roche's ability to manufacture and commercialize medicines has resulted in amazing synergies above and beyond the work that both companies had been able to accomplish uh, independently. And in Japan, uh, Roche formed a strategic alliance in 2002 with Chugai, one of the country's leading research-based pharmaceutical companies with a strong uh, presence in biotech products. Chugai is working, on, uh, working to develop innovative products with global applications. They have a focus on oncology as well, as well as renal and bone uh, joint diseases. We continue to view acquisitions and partnering as a significant element of our corporate strategy. Early this year at a JP Morgan conference in San Francisco, we had two of our senior executives responsible for partnerships, and they spoke about the significant investments we're making. Here you see a, uh, a comment from Sophie Kornowski Bonet. She's head of uh, farmer partnering in Roche Basel. And you can see that there's a significant amount of work uh, that occurs with external partners to help drive innovation and medical advances. Acquisitions and partnering are more common uh, within the pharma industry. We're not alone in this endeavor, uh, but at our core, we're in the business of research and development. But as you can see from the slide, there is a dramatic transition with regards to the number of new molecular entities, or NMEs as we refer to them, launched in relation to R&D spend. So we're spending a lot of money, significant amounts of money, but productivity is, is uh, not reaching our R&D spend. Our industry is now spending significantly more than ever before to understand the mechanisms of disease and find new treatment options, but at the same time, we're seeing decline in the results of these efforts. As you've gathered, our commitment to R&D is significant. At $10 billion in 2013, it's second to none in our industry and a third only behind Volkswagen and Samsung in terms of absolute dollars, and we're ahead of Intel uh, and Microsoft in the top five, so we're in, we're in good company. So what else sets uh, Roche apart from competitors? 
Well, we actually have two completely separate research development uh, divisions, sorry, under the uh, Roche uh, organization. Here's the current uh, top level R&D structure at Roche. So there are three separate research and early development groups. PRED, which is pharma, uh, pharma research and early development. GRED, which is Genentech research and early development. And Chugai uh, in Japan, as I mentioned. So at any time, these organizations have over 50 ongoing alliances allowing Roche to access close to 200 companies worth of innovation to fuel our global product development, manufacturing, commercialization engine. So now that you know a little bit about our history and the decisions we've made in terms of strategic partnerships and how we're applying it, um, we have made a strategic decision to focus our research and development in the area of personalized healthcare, or also known as personalized medicine or precision medicine. We believe that this was the direction where healthcare would be going, and it was the right approach, not just as a company, but our industry, and most importantly, for patients. So, this quote, it's much more important to know what sort of patient has a disease than what sort of disease the patient has. It's a very old quote, but is still relevant today. This was from Hippocrates nearly 2,500 years ago. And at Roche, we use this quote often because it reminds us of the importance of understanding the inherent differences among patients. So what do we mean by precision medicine? So precision medicine at Roche means fitting the treatment to the patients, providing the right therapy for the right group of people at the right time. And historically, conventional medicines have, all, have often been prescribed on a one-size-fits-all basis and has not always produced the desired outcomes. Uh, for example, a large part, a large number of adverse drug reactions and inaccurate diagnosis are in part responsible for approximately 200,000 deaths each year in the US alone. So what we're hoping to achieve uh, with personal precision medicine is we're able to directly uh, up uh, apply therapy to patients that are most likely to benefit from them in only these patients. So we exclude the other patients that we believe will not benefit. Beyond the obvious benefits for the patients, it's also most uh, uh, a significantly more effective use of the uh, increasing uh, limited healthcare dollars. And one of the best and first examples of precision medicine is Herceptin which is a treatment for HER2 positive breast cancer. So as a research-based company with a focus on biologics, monoclonal antibodies, our approach is to find a bio biomarker or test to link it to therapy. And that's where Herceptin comes into the picture. So approximately 20 to 25 to 30 percent of women with bre breast cancer express a protein responsible for the actual growth of the tumors known as HER2. Uh, or as it's also referred to as HER2 positive. So by identifying the women that express this genetic mutation, we're able to focus only on those that have a high likelihood of responding to this treatment. And today, more than 25,000 women in Canada and approximately 1.3 million women worldwide have been treated with this drug. So initially, the drug and the initial results actually were not considered to be particularly uh, positive because the majority of patients didn't see a benefit. But when we started looking at it closer and understood the underlying pathology of the disease, uh, this has now transformed this medicine to a unprecedented breakthrough in treating breast cancer and is now considered standard of care. So early I mentioned the quote from Hippocrates and understanding the need for patients first. For Roche, that's where our diagnostic business plays a role. So in 2006, as I mentioned, we made a strategic decision to focus on precision medicine when Roche implemented the personalized healthcare strategy as part of the group's core strategy. At a time when others in our industry were continuing to forge ahead with a focus on blockbuster primary care treatments, which is more along the lines of the one-size-fits-all approach. 
However, the organization believed that precision medicine was the future of not just our industry, but the direction where healthcare would and really should be moving. What differentiated Roche, our competitive advantage, was that we have both pharma and diagnostics together under one umbrella. So with our in-house expertise in pharma and diagnostics, we're best positioned to make precision medicine a reality. The collaboration between pharma and diagnostics begins during the earliest stages of research and enables us to freely exchange intellectual property and information between each division, which is a challenge for organizations that don't have a diagnostics uh, arm of their organization. Uh, in fact, all our drug development programs have an associated biomarker program. Today, uh, we have more than 200 projects in collaboration between the two organizations. And beyond creating new medicines, innovative pharmaceutical companies also have an impact on the economy through the creation of jobs and investment across a number of sectors. But how do we quantify this impact we have? Well, in 2013, we commissioned an independent assessment of our economic impact in Canada, both at a provincial federal level, and this examined uh, both the direct and indirect impact on the economy. And here's what we learned. So in total, our investments in the Canadian economy was over one billion in the past two years. For every person employed with our organization in 2011 and 2012, an additional full-time employee job was created. And also for one, every $1 GDP directly generated by Roche Canada, an additional $2 of GDP are generated through indirect effects. So closer to home for us here in Ontario, we found out that Roche generated more than $700 million in economic activity over the last two years. So where does the future, what does the future hold and where do we see Roche in the years ahead? Well, clearly we don't have a crystal ball, but there are a number of trends and changes on the horizon that we believe are strong indicators of where we think healthcare is going. So we're confident that we focus our R&D partnerships in therapeutic areas with tremendous potential. We've got a robust pipeline with new medicines at various stages of development. Here, uh, I show the uh, phase one pipeline. We've got 36 new molecular entities, the majority of which are in oncology, which is a area of expertise in our organization. In phase two, and phase three, there's more of a balance in other therapeutic areas such as immunology and as, uh, as becoming increasingly important is the area of neuroscience where there's a significant unmet medical need in diseases such as Alzheimer's. We're investing heavily. And this is phase three. And in registration, it's predominantly oncology. So although we have seven, over 70 new molecular entities, we're realistic in our expectations that, of course, not all of them will be successful, but we're confident that many of them will ultimately find their way to patients. So we know precision medicine will continue to become a greater priority for stakeholders across the healthcare spectrum. With an aging population, the demand for publicly funded healthcare has reached unprecedented heights. Governments are forced to stretch their limited resources even further with a greater eye on reimbursement only for those treatments. They're confident that can be targeted to those who will benefit. An approach that's already beginning to play out across the, uh, across the country. Sorry. In Quebec, for example, the provincial government indicated a willingness to support personalized health care when it announced a $10 million investment in the Personalized Medicine Partnership for Cancer an initiative that is encouraging for us, though, of us though, that are convinced that this is the way forward. Patients will continue to become more aware and informed and play an increasing larger role in the management of their health. And perhaps one of the greatest examples of this is in BC, where 30% of GPs have already seen a patient who has their genome profiled to determine what diseases they may be predisposed and what treatments are likely to be most effective. 
So clearly the pharma industry will continue to evolve. Uh, not long ago it was dominated by several large multinationals with a stable of blockbuster medicines that treated primary care diseases like hypertension and high cholesterol. Looking forward, the number of truly big pharma companies is expected to diminish. Those remaining will focus on specific diseases, rare diseases, where their financial growth and R&D innovation will be realized from both internal discoveries and carefully selected partnerships and acquisitions. Finally, we believe in Canada. Uh, we have a huge role to play in the future of healthcare. We have a tremendous talent pool to grow upon, one that Roche leverages both locally and at a global level. Earlier, I mentioned our partnerships with various hospitals and other research-based organizations across the company. Closer to home in Mississauga, Roche has partnered with the University of Toronto Masters of Biotechnology Department for a number of years. We've currently got six U of T uh, co-op students working with a number of teams, one of which is in my team, five of which are in biotech students and one uh, in the MBA program. In fact, we've had more than 30 students since we established our partnership with the university. Several of these students have become full-time employees, which is great now holding roles through the organization from our sales force and various marketing teams to positions in our offices in Switzerland. So it's a double-edged sword. We've got great homegrown talent, but there's not a month that goes by when one of our colleagues doesn't get identified for either a global role or a position in another marketplace. We, we're obviously disappointed when we see great people leave, uh, but it's far outweighed by our sense of pride and seeing Canadians located all throughout the Roche world. So in closing, I hope I've conveyed to you the sense of optimism and potential we believe exists for innovative companies and organizations here in Canada, and I hope you found my talk informative. Thank you. Sure. All right, so now I'd like to uh, open the floor to questions uh, if there are there any on the floor? I think there's one coming up. Sure. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very, uh, very insightful. Uh, the question I have is, uh, is it, we at OCE work very closely with small companies trying to develop either diagnostic platforms or therapeutics. Um, how does a company, you know, just in the early stages of development or validation, get in touch with Roche or other pharmaceutical companies to work with them, uh, develop something, develop more of a strategic partnership with, uh, with large pharma? So it's quite easy. I'll give you my card okay. and uh, you can come talk to us and uh, we can hopefully, if it's the right opportunity, put you in touch mm -hmm. with uh, one of our uh, strategic uh, partnership uh, individuals, either in, in uh, Basel or, or California. Okay. So we're happy to uh, discuss it with you. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. So uh, I'm thinking that maybe one of the things that would be interesting for the group is if you could talk a little bit about what attracted Hoffman to come to Mississauga and Ontario as a, a place to, to encourage this tremendous investment that you've made uh, in innovation and in the biotech. Well, I think, first of all, you have to have a, a skilled workforce, and clearly uh, we have that in uh, the GTA. So uh, we've had no problem filling the positions. A lot of individuals have joined us from contract research organizations uh, and other pharma companies. And then also it is more cost-effective to do business in Mississauga than perhaps it is in other areas of the world. It's cheaper. Uh, than, than uh, it would be in, in San Francisco, for example, or, or other major uh, cities. So uh, it's a good value proposition for the organization, so that's why they decided to invest, and we've been able to demonstrate that we can deliver. So um, it's all about results. Okay, other questions? Jason, go ahead. Thanks. So we've seen recently in Quebec some divestments from Big Farm and some of their R&D, and Roche has been successful in attracting a pretty big clinical trials investment in Mississauga. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to um, that value proposition to head office in attracting those global mandates and, and how Roche was able to, to land that? And you mentioned cost uh, factors, but that was a 
fairly significant global investment. So maybe some of the considerations around that beyond cost. Yeah, I think it, it really does speak to the quality of research and development in Canada. Um, obviously, with uh, some of the top uh, hospitals and institutions here, um, we're able to recruit patients for trials. Um, the quality of the clinical data that we're able to produce is really, really important when it comes to uh, facing regulators when you want to get your drug improved. So all those things go into determining where they want to place clinical trials. Um, and it is certainly an increasingly competitive environment globally for uh, clinical trials and programs. So um, we really need to focus in on what our uh, quality is and then also meeting our commitments. That's a big part of it. So you're right, it's not solely focused on cost. It, it's that quality and, and also to be able to deliver on time. Uh, two questions. One is, uh, is that personalized medicine is same with precision medicine? It's a great question. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say precision medicine is, personalized medicine is something I think that physicians per, uh, practice every day. So, for example, if you're a patient with rheumatoid arthritis and you need to go on a biologic medicine, there's a number of different options that the physician can choose depending on your lifestyle. So, if you travel a lot, perhaps a drug that's delivered by subcutaneous administration may not be appropriate for you because you have to go through security and carry, you need to keep your, your drug cold. Uh, so they may decide in conjunction with you or the patient uh, that an infusion drug is more appropriate. So that, that type of approach is personalizing the therapy to that individual. Precision medicine is much more looking at the actual underlying disease process, what is actually driving the, the pathogenesis of the disease. So for those of you that are, are working in the diagnostic space, you know now with the uh, molecular profiling that's available, uh, physicians are able to target the underlying uh, uh, problem associated with, in this case, would be cancer. So it's much more precise and it's getting down to the very individual level and the molecular basis for disease. Uh, there's a second question is, uh, uh, do you see any difficulty from uh, regulatory approval for this kind of uh, precision medicine? Are there any uh, standard difficulty from uh, Health Canada or, because I have experience uh, in the regulatory field in the uh, mm -hmm. US FDA and uh, China and Japan. Mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, FDA agency is facing the challenge to approve those kind of uh, personalized medicine or precision medicine. Is that any difficulty oh, there? I think actually regulators embrace the concept because what you're essentially trying to do is, is ensure that you're treating the right patients with the right drug. So when you're talking about regulators always are assessing the risk benefit profile of a drug. So what are the potential adverse events versus the benefit? And in this case, with precision medicine and personalized healthcare, uh, per personalized medicine, sorry, you're able to uh, assure a better response by identifying those patients more likely to benefit from the drug. So the benefit risk ratio is actually more favorable than non targeted drugs. So overall, the FDA and Health Canada are embracing it. Okay, so there's uh, any clinical trial or requirement increasing, like the number of the patients in each each area of the... And it, it really depends on the individual drug. Mm. Um, in theory, you may be able to uh, treat a smaller number of patients, um, mm. but then you may have to screen a lot of patients to determine whether they could benefit from the drug. Uh, do you think Roche has better chance in Canada because Health Canada is better than easier to support Roche's uh, approach for uh, precision medicine than U.S. FDA or other country? Uh, I think, you know, Health Canada is, has some pretty strict regulatory requirements. So does the FDA. So we don't, we don't get off easy here. Uh, they mm -hmm. have the same type of standards that they would in any other, uh, uh, any other westernized com uh, country. So uh, we're held to very high standards in Canada. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome.
Okay. All right, Ian, thank you very much. I really appreciate you sharing uh, the, the nature of your company and, and in particular the advantage that you have in having both the diagnostic and the pharmaceutical arms uh, capable of working together. As part of the uh, aging workforce here in Canada, it gives me great hope to know that companies like yours are taking care of the things that are going to keep me healthy longer. Um, so on behalf of OCE, please accept this small token from us for joining us today. Thank you.